Hi, Mavis. It's uh, really, really, really nice to have you with me today. Um, feels really, really special. Wonderful. It's really wonderful to be with you, Anik. Let me have a chance to introduce you. It's I've learned that you don't like to be in the spotlights, but um, I do feel it's important to introduce you to people. Um, and before I do, I want to say that in, in this last few days, when I was thinking of how will I introduce you, that for me, the thing that was most right for you to introduce you, and maybe you're going to start off on this, but for me was you should at a certain point are entitled to win like a Nobel prize for peace. And I mean that I was really doubting to say this, but the work that you've done over the years is so, so meaningful for so many people that I, I thought, will I say this? And, and I thought, yes, of course, I'm going to say this. Um, it's kind of overwhelming to hear. Yeah, I thought so, but it's heartfelt and honest what I think. So let me introduce you to people. Um, Dr. Mavis Tsai is a clinical psychologist and a senior research scientist at the University of Washington's Center for Science of Social Connection. She is the co-author of Functional Analytic Psychotherapy, a treatment that uses the power of the therapeutic relationship to help transform clients' lives. She is the co-author of five books on FAP, some which have been translated into Portuguese, Spanish, Japanese, Italian, Korean, and Persian, and over 70 articles and book chapters. She received the Distinguished Psychologist Award from the Washington State Psychological Association in recognition of significant contributions to the field of psychology and is a fellow of the ACBS or the Association for Contextual Behavioral Science. She is named by New Harbinger Publications, one of 13 badass psychologists who happen to be women. Dr. Tsai is the founder and executive director of the nonprofit organization, which we will be talking about today, Awareness, Courage and Love Global Project. Since 2015, and I think it's important to mention this, it's before the pandemic, it aimed already at, at addressing the pandemic of social isolation and loneliness. She does this by training herself, volunteers to lead chapters in six continents and while we're talking, 92 cities to help bring more open heartedness, humanity and authentic connection into this world. Thank you for such a wonderful introduction, Anik. Thank you for being here. I'm just, I'm so grateful that you're not just talking about the Awareness, Courage, and Love Global Project. You're a very key part of it as a chapter leader. Yes. Yeah. Yes. And I'm really glad that I am. It's an honor to be part of that project. Yeah. I was... Um, I, I, we talked a little before we started the, the, this conversation and I was saying that in preparation of this, how strong for me it feels that you are one of the few people I know that really are on the path to do what you're here to do. I am. Yeah. That's just exceptional that people just, that you so strongly seem to, um, I don't know if it's the right word, organize your actions towards the things that are very important for you to do. I have this belief that ideas and dreams and visions actually capture us rather than us coming up with it ourselves. Yeah. So it very much feels like that 
it's like a divine inspiration. Mm -hmm. and I'm simply an instrument carrying out something that's really, really important. Yeah. That's that's really I'm I'm actually happy that you're saying that being a scientist um, because it feels the same for me that it's not like it's a question that we often ask like how do you know what is the path you're supposed to walk on but it's 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 trying to be I think your purest self and then listening to to what is brought to you and trusting that path in a way. You really get it, Anik. Yeah, as far as you can get this, because it's it's a miracle in a sense. But um, yeah, and you obviously trusted it in a world of science to start working your way to go and do research on social connection. I think the research started before we yeah. started this project. But yeah. It goes hand in hand. Yeah. Yeah. Do you know how 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 you because I think you've been going on with this for a very long time, I think, right? Yeah. So it it's somehow you have been looking for your purest self on this planet. Uh, must have started that search must have started very young age or something I think from the time I was very young Anik I I could tell that my purest self was really wanting to be connected to the essence of others mm -hmm. and to their truth mm -hmm. I just never liked to make small talk I always wanted to go for what was the most deep and potent in terms of conversations. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it just grew out of that. So I'm excited that you and I are going to have one of those conversations. Yes, yes, we are. Yes, we are. What we're going to do today is have a um, like awareness, courage and love meet up. Like I am a volunteer in the global network. Um, and so now and again, I organize um, uh, for a very low price, um, uh, the, like a, a gathering of people who want to learn something about um, the truest connection, the, the deepest connection that you can find with others, open heartedness, humanity, all that type of things. We're engaged in um, having people, giving people the opportunity to experience that. And so today I'm honored that Mavis will be doing such a meetup with me. And if you're willing, I would say if you're listening to this, um, try and just take a minute to really engage in, in, in what we're doing here, because no doubt that it will be a very... Um, special conversation that you'll be hearing and, and maybe um, taking things with you yourself if you're listening to this. Yes, the invitation is not just to listen to us, but to engage in the experience yes. yourself if you're watching this. Yes, exactly. And what you're saying, Anik, about the focus of the ACL project being on connecting authentically with others. I just want to emphasize that we really cannot connect authentically with others unless we're first very authentically connected with ourselves. Mm -hmm. And so there's this two-prong focus yeah. in every meetup that we first invite deep connection with ourselves. Exactly. Connecting with others. Yes. May I share my screen and talk a little bit about? You may. Absolutely, you may. So this is our, our mission statement for the ACL Global Project, that we're a worldwide network of open-hearted change seekers who strive to meet life's challenges through deepening interpersonal connection 
and rising to live more true to ourselves. As Anique was saying, we're in six continents and ever growing. And it's, it's for people from all walks of life who want to have this experience of being connected to self and others. And we welcome participants and we welcome people who just want to train to be leaders. And you can be a leader of just a small family and friends group. It doesn't have to be anything huge. We want mm -hmm. people to start small. So I, with my chapter leaders, uh, we co-write protocols every month focusing on different themes. And the one that I want to do with you, Annie, is one that I just did with Gabi Lopez Elias in Argentina. We wrote a protocol on honoring life in memory of best friends who we lost. The focus on honoring life is that we actually can't be free from pain, loss, or death as long as we're alive. And so in order to honor life, we're choosing to welcome all of our feelings fully and to embrace this moment. So that's what I'm wanting to do with you mm -hmm. today, Anique. And I think it took a lot of courage for you just to say yes. It did. To the experience we're going to have. It did. Yeah, maybe it's um, it's good to to say something why uh, this for me was a courageous thing to do. Um, my sister uh, died in 2018. She um, committed suicide, and um, it's been a very overwhelming um, loss. And I'm I'm happy and open to share. Uh, or go into the experience that you're willing to do with me on this topic. And this came up for me because I lost my sister suddenly last November and mm -hmm. you were so loving in how you reached out to me as I hope I was. Yes, you were. You when Absolutely. I when I heard about your sister yeah. dying, it was just so heartbreaking to me. And when you reached out to me, I knew I wanted to talk with you at some point about it. I didn't want to do it over email. Mm. This morning I thought, this is the time for us to share. Mm. So in, in every meetup, there's a guided meditation focusing on the theme. And I'm going to invite you and whoever is listening to experience the meditation it's going to be about six or seven minutes and it's going to help us deepen the experience of delving into the questions that we'll be exploring about honoring life and loss okay so you ready i am okay settle comfortably in your chair breathe gently and deeply Feel the air that gives you life. Inhale deeply and exhale tenderly. See if you can feel in each breath your heart in your chest as it beats. its vulnerability, its tenderness, its courage. Your heart tells you that you are alive, present here and now. Your heart reminds you that your life is a miracle and a gift. If you'd like, put your hand on your chest and caress your heart. 
seeing if you can feel your heartbeat. Who is your heart given love to? And who is your heart received love from? Allow to arise in your mind's eye images of humans or animals you love or have loved. Beings who have loved you past or present, alive or, pa or passed on. Can you allow the feeling of love to embrace you fully in this moment? Take a moment to be in the center of your being. How is your heart now? I invite you to surrender to curiosity, compassion, to a sense of discovery in terms of whatever your heart is feeling. If you can or if you wish, awaken in you the desires that have chosen you and let yourself feel them fully. How do your desires give your life meaning? What is your soul a longing for? How can you honor your life as your most precious treasure? Now take three more deep breaths and gradually open your eyes and come back to this room as you feel ready.
I want to honor you, the person in front of me, your light, your vibrance, and our connection. What came up for you in this meditation, Anique? I could see, I could just see emotion in your face. Um, the, I could feel the vulnerability of this conversation and the, the anxiety of will I get a lot of emotions and how will that go? And at the same time, I could feel the tenderness and the, the power of that. Um, the, the gentleness that is in our conversation now and how I seem to have the courage to talk about that because there is a power um, connected to gentleness and love and tenderness and I could feel that very powerfully I could feel that I do feel so much tenderness and love. So, Anique, what we do in the meetup is we go into contemplation questions. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to share the contemplation questions that go along with this protocol, this theme but we're not gonna have time to go over all of them. Mm -hmm. And I'm just going to ask that we focus on one or two of the questions. Yes. So I'm gonna share my screen again. And the question I would like us to focus on is number two. Honoring life and loss are inseparable. What are the losses you need to honor? Be tender with yourself. If we have time, we'll go over another question, but I would like us to have time to just really honor our sisters. Um. I think for me, the relationship with my sister was quite complex. And it really took me a while to be able to, uh, to find a way to honor it, not just by like doing a deed and then checking the box. And uh, that was really a search I had to go through. And at a certain point, I could, when I, when I thought of her as a person, I always, I shut down. There was not really much that came up. And that was really painful to, to, to not having that as a source. And then I um, found that if I think of her and me together, I can feel the sisterhood. I can feel the connection that we had and that we still have. I can still feel her. And I'm not talking about like in a ghost sense of in a, but I can feel the connection that I had with her. Um, and so I, I, I really consciously try to to, to connect with that feeling that I had with her. Because there, there is love and there is um, non-judgment, not from her, not from me. We just are sisters. And from that place, I can really wish her the best the, the, the most 
in in this sense, I can really say that it's a brave thing that she decided herself what she wanted with this life. Even if it was a decision in pain, but I need to honor that she made that decision. And I have really the utmost respect for it. I'm really sitting with the power of your words. Imagine that. Audience members who are listening to this. have experienced the suicide of someone they love. And I think it's one of the hardest things to do. I need to honor the choice mm -hmm. of suicide. Mm -hmm. I th for me, I think by doing that, I, um, by respecting her choice, I don't reduce her in a sense to a person in pain, but a person who made a choice. We're equals. We're not, I'm not her bigger sister that, you know, is concerned about my sister who always had a struggle in her life. But by honoring you made a choice and you're entitled to make choices. And I love you even if you did make that choice. And even if I feel lost and completely overwhelmed. And when I first got the news, I mean, that was hell to go through. Never experienced such a painful time. So I'm, I'm happy that I can find that place of love for her, with her in a sense, even. Can you say more about the experience of being so connected to her that you feel this love so deeply? Because you start off by saying, I, I, it's a very complicated relationship and it wasn't easy for you to get to this place of love and connection. Yeah, it was really hard. Um, I literally got blank. I, I, my head just got blank every time I tried to find a way to mourn and to honor her. And there was nothing that I could find. And I... <laughs> I, I, I guess I, I, I looked for memories for the both of us together. And I could think of this memory where we went to the library with our school and uh, we had to return books. And my sister was very uh, sloppy. So she forgot the books and they were like, I don't know where they never really returned to the library. And so the librarian said to me, oh, and I forgot books. And she said, oh, you're one of those sisters um, of the Says family. And now I can smile over it. And I think, yeah, we were those sisters who forgot our books and didn't return them. And But we were so much more than that. We had the same humor, the same kind of intelligence. Um, and I, when I thought of that, of what we had of what linked us together. It's also, of course, it's also our complicated and tough history that we have. I mean, there is no one who knows what it's like to experience that but her. We're connected in that, we always will be. Um, so I guess that's what I went to look for. What made us us as sisters. And that, that, that a certain feeling came up with that. And I can just, when I talk about it, it's right there. I can sense it immediately. Just, I'm, I'm feeling teary listening to you. Yeah, me too. <laughs> me too. So 
I just want to reflect back to you what I heard, just the essence of what you shared with me. That when you first heard the news that she had committed suicide, you just felt blank. You couldn't, you couldn't connect and you felt like you were in hell when you did connect with feelings. Mm -hmm. And it's been such a complex relationship. Like over time, it seemed like there was this yearning for connection that wasn't quite there. And after she died, you gradually came to this process of both being able to feel the connection of you as sisters. It's feeling the love that's always been there, the shared experiences. And you told me about this experience of going to the library and, and like not having books and that you're supposed to return. And that that's one of many, many memories that only the two of you share as sisters. And that when you tapped into that, you were able to really connect with the uniqueness of your bond. And then you're able to honor her choice to take her own life as just a powerful, courageous choice. Mm. even though the consequences for you and others who love her are devastating. Mm. You're still able to honor that that was her choice. And so I'm, I'm sensing this combination of, of both pain and it seems like a, a, just a, an acceptance and peace mm -hmm. as well. Yeah. An abiding love. Yeah. Is there, is there anything that you want me to get that you haven't said or that I didn't reflect? Thanks for asking that. Um, no, I think you're, I feel understood. Um, when you reflected back to me, it felt like hell, although you repeated in a sense what I said, um, I still felt understood on a deeper level that yes, that is what it was. Um, and you gave back to me what a struggle it was to find that connection and to go through that struggle of, of how can I mourn um, I guess what I'm getting better when I hear your words is that the reason that I could not find a way to mourn her was because I wanted to make the memories more beautiful than they are and um, and that's where I got lost um, and then I thought, well, I cannot mourn for all the difficult things that happened between us. Um, so I guess that in a sense, I was looking for authenticity in the mourning process. process. Um, I'm getting better that that is what I did. And, and I can own that as well. It's part of me to go look for that. I just wasn't conscious of it, that that is what I did. I'm, I'm hearing you say that you were wanting to have loftier, more sublime memories somehow, yeah. and that you are coming to terms with ordinary memories that actually can be very special mm -hmm. memories. Mm -hmm. like the the memory that you told me of going to the library and 
the librarian laughing that, you know, here you are, the say sisters and yeah, I forgot your books. There's something really remarkable about that as well. Mm-hmm. You know, it's like a, an everyday occurrence, but it reflected something so deep about you being sisters and having this shared yeah. experience. I think I went looking for the typically us type of memories and that I could connect to. I'm, it, this is making me think about the memories that I have of my sister. Mm -hmm. So in a in a typical uh, breakout session in in an ACL meetup, everybody has a turn in speaking vulnerably and being listened to. So I'm I'm going to tell you and be given something back as well. Bit, yeah, yeah. Tell you a bit about my sister who uh, she was 10 years older than me and. She was very, very different. And I, I felt this huge struggle to try to connect with her and was finally making some strides towards the end of her life. But my father was a doctor and my mother a nurse and they just prized left brain functioning, which I'm really good at. You're just good at school, good at academics. And my sister was very much into artistry. She played the piano beautifully. When she was 16, she wanted to I told my mother, I, I want I want to be a ballet dancer. And my mother said, that's obscene. You're not going to be a ballet dancer. And so her spirit was just broken. And she eventually went on to pursue being a ballet dancer, which is actually quite amazing, but she became a professional ballet dancer for the Southern California Ballet Company. But because my parents favored me, she always felt on the outside and she took it out on me. I think she just didn't like me. And I couldn't, I, I just, didn't feel any kind of inclusion in her life. But at some point I realized that I wasn't treating her too much better than she was treating me, that I would make these attempts for connection, but I wasn't putting her first. So she and my brother both lived in Southern California and I would, I would always go visit my brother and then I'd say, I'm coming to visit our brother and can I see you? It wasn't like, I want to come see you. So at some point I just apologized for not being a good enough sister to her. Although I had always felt like she wasn't a good enough sister to me because I would just focus on the bids for attention that I made and that she turned down. But I I just said I haven't been I haven't been a good sister to you and I want to apologize for it and let me know when you would like me to visit you and I will clear out my schedule and I'll come and see you. And she didn't take me up on it, but I think it meant a lot to her that I apologized and offered to do that. And, and we started, so she, she didn't do email. She didn't, she didn't do any social media stuff. She 
didn't even talk on the phone. She just wanted to write letters. And we started this beautiful correspondence of writing letters to each other. And I've got like a pile of letters. And I, I felt like I started getting my sister back. She would write memories of us, how she took care of me as a child. And she said, you're just, you were just smart as a little kid. And, and yeah, just told me memories that I didn't have of myself. And I, I just, I thought that, so my mother lived to like 91 and my father lived to 96. And I just thought, oh, my sister and I are gonna have more time. And she died at 76 and it was really sudden. I'm, I'm not quite sure what happened. She said that, she told me quite some time ago that she had breast cancer and she couldn't be treated for it because her system was too sensitive to any kind of medication and she couldn't have surgery. But that was like 15 years ago and she's kept living. She took like really, really good care of herself and ate and just did this clean living stuff. And, and But on her death certificate, Certificate. It's a breast cancer. She had some kind of burst gland. I mean, I I don't understand what happened, but it was really sudden, and I didn't get a chance to say goodbye. Uh, my last communication to her, she was just being so loving about my son getting married, and and apologize for the ring in the background. That's okay. So she, and what I feel like I've lost is any sense of being able to connect more deeply. It's like our relationship just stopped here and I was only just starting to make up for lost time. And I'm not going to have, just it's just been arrested in time and mm -hmm. i'm always gonna have this longing for the sister that i barely had this is so familiar so familiar my father died in 2017 and i hadn't had contact with my sister at that moment so we had to connect to make some decisions about my father's death. And that means that the year before she died, we had a lovely connection that we never had before. And we started talking more genuinely and yeah, more warmly, open-heartedly, non-judgmentally with each other. And, and then suddenly it stopped, so. That reminds me, I just want to say one more thing. Mm -hmm. She was estranged from our family for long periods of time. And when my father died, she didn't even acknowledge it. She didn't come to his funeral. She was just like gone. And I was so angry about it. Mm -hmm. And like she barely made it to our mother's deathbed. And she, she did come to the memorial service. And I said to her, at the memorial service, what happened? Why did you not come to our father's service? Um, like, why did you not acknowledge that he was dying? And, and she said, Mavis, I have felt abandoned by him so many times in my life, there was no way I was going to his deathbed so that he could abandon me again, final time. And when I heard that, I totally forgave her. It's like I had no idea the pain that she went through. Mm -hmm. It's like, of course, you're not gonna go there and be abandoned one final time. We had a conversation about that, too, because that was the first thing we had to do after a long time that we didn't talk was, will you be going to the funeral? Will I be going to the funeral? And we really had an open hearted conversation about that. And she went and I didn't. And um, 
was difficult for the both of us. And I gave her all the room that she needed to tell me how it was for her to go. And um, wow, this is a very similar, in a way, similar kind of experience. Mm. Let me give you something back about what I heard. Um, what really um, stood out for me was that um, the admiration that you showed on your face or on and in your intonation of your voice when you t talked about the fact that when she was 16, she told your mother she wanted to be a ballet dancer and how you saw that she was broken by it i could i could see that that's a vivid memory that she was broken by it um so it it just for me it, it i i saw this young girl mavis who probably for a long time wanted connection with her sister being so attentive on, on noticing this and and um, so you must have been looking for a connection between the both of you for so long um, and how you then later on really dived deep into your soul to look at your relationship with her um, to know you wanted a better one and to start founding that better relationship by looking at yourself and saying, I'm sorry if you felt that I don't treat you, that I didn't treat you right as a sister. That, I mean, the thing that came up for me was that is so wise to and so honest to make a connection from that uh, point of view. And that gave you your pile of letters that you invited her and she took it. And I'm so, so happy for you that you still have those and that you can read them endlessly again and again and probably discover things again and again while you read them again. And I could see the, the little like you're, I, I, I think it might be something that I'm sensing and it's your, not yours, your experience, but I, I feel some, a feeling of um, empty handedness, like she's gone and, and I, and how can I not have known about the fact that this might have been a medical cause that she died? Why didn't we talk about it? I wish we did. Something like that is, is empty handedness was the word that came to me. Mm. It's really wonderful having your attentiveness in your attunement, Anique. Just, I feel very held and cared about. It just feels very healing, mm. this conversation with you. Yes. And, and yes, you caught, let me have you reflect what my facial expressions were like I I'm so proud of her for pursuing her dreams and you're both if if sorry if I interrupt if I look at my own morning and, and going to look for connection you're both very passionate women in going for the things that you're here for as we said from the beginning she obviously did the same thing that's remarkable and i think we have our parents and our ancestors True. to thank for who we are yeah So do we have time to cover one more question? Do you feel I do complete I'm, in our discussion of our sisters? I do. Do you? 
Yeah. How do you feel about it? I feel I feel that it is that we're talking about essence and I just absolutely love connecting to my heart and going to talk with people about essence and I think that's what we're doing so I'm enjoying this conversation how vulnerable it is It's really precious. Yeah. It is. It really is. So I'm curious about this dream that you have of this podcast that you're doing. I I think this is, this feels really important for you to pursue right now. Do you want to talk to me about that? Or do you want to tell me something else that feels important in terms of honoring your life and honoring your gifts and passions? I'm happy to talk about that. And I think I can take the, the, the question that was underneath, like, what if, if I were to die, what would I regret? I think it's a combination of both that I can, I'm happy to, to share something about that. Um, so when my sister died, I really felt like this is a very, is a time to go back to essence. Um, I really took that invitation to really go and see, like, what is it that I am here for? What is it that I long for in connection to other people? I really wanted to do that homework thoroughly. Um, And so I... And it was it was difficult in a sense because I had a training center at the time and I did it good and I mean everybody was happy and I had a lot of positive feedback time and again and again and I always use the symbolic that I had it was so hard to go through this morning process that I went from when I went from my living room to my kitchen I I oftentimes sat by the the heat heating um just sitting on the ground weeping and crying and and i really felt like okay what is a reason to get up why will i get up and this time i want to know and then i i felt like okay this training center i'm not that sure even if i'm good at it I don't think this is what I want, but apparently there's something in it that I really like. And what is it that I like and what is it that I don't like? Um, And I guess when, when I was surviving as much as I was before my sister died, doing things well and being capable was a very nice way to survive even if it if my life didn't feel as if it was mine but it was a nice life to lead and so i i started i i always do this when i talk about it i i talk about the in dutch in german we say fingerspitzegefühl the 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 top of your fingers where if you're blind and you need to you know have the top of your fingers um to sense things So I was looking for, um, what do I know? And I thought, I know I like to talk about people with, about essence. That is so something I did from when I was very young to talk about that. It is something that I find invigorating, um, and the most essential thing that we can do in our lives. And then I thought, okay, do I still want to do therapy with people? Do I still want to do coaching with people? And I really looked into um, the positive feedback. Look, am I doing this because I get positive feedback or am I doing this because there's something in it that I find so valuable that I want to pursue this? And so I decided I'll keep the practice. I had three pra- practices at a time. I left, I I let the other two go i kept one practice and i started looking with the people here i'm in the practice right now um like where is this practice gonna go what will we be doing with it um 
And so we made a vision of where we would be going with this. And part of that role for me, and I never really wanted to admit it, but is I'm, I can inspire people and I should take up that role. Um, and so the combination of that is that I, I think in, in this house, I'm probably the person that inspires the rest of the team to move and have a strong vision of where we're going, um, to do podcasts, uh, to be a keynote speaker, um, because that's the thing that feels divine to me to do. Um, and a few months ago, my therapist asked me, and what if you would have no, um, if there would be nothing standing in your way of doing that? And when she was at, like, if I can help you take away everything that keeps you from saying that you inspire people and from really wanting to reach a, like a big audience in, in inspiration and in talking about essence, what if I would help you take away all of those hurdles? And I just... I started crying and I said, I'm not ready. I'm not ready. I cannot do this. And the tears made me say, okay, that's, that's apparently that's where I need to go. Um, so it's a very, very conscious choice uh, doing this. And, and I realized while I was making these choices, I'm in the middle of morning. This might be a mistake. I might be not really able to listen to what my heart or what my soul really is telling me, but I'm committed to having that conversation with myself ongoing. If this is the path, that is what I'm supposed to be doing. Anik, I have goosebumps listening to you. <laughs> yes, you inspire me and... <laughs> Sure you inspire anyone else you speak to as well and get to listen to you and i'm so glad that i invited you to say what you did <laughs> i'm very happy to share it with you and that was that was just so powerful to listen to thanks <laughs> we're running out of time so can i share one more slide please yes although you didn't answer the question yourself i I didn't answer the question myself because I am, I am living. Yeah, you are. The essence. Yes, you are. My vision. And yeah, you are. Yeah, I just, I, I want every person who feels called to live with awareness, courage, and love to, to be able to find that in their community to find a meeting in their community or to learn how to build one yeah build a meeting and be a leader so important the work you're doing is so important and and i feel like we are allies in our work which is thrilling <laughs> for me sounds a bit strange when you're saying that to me <laughs> but i'll take it <laughs> It's the truth. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so this is an invitation for whoever is listening to join our eight-week self-paced leadership training. It's free. Mm -hmm. And it's for anyone who wants to develop more of your potential to be a leader. And like I said, you can start very, very small. So just email me at mavist at aclglobal.org and just put in the subject line ACL leader. You don't have to write anything more than that. Yes. Uh, and you can say that you, you watched Anik's podcast. Yeah. You're interested in more if, information. If people feel inspired by what we showed today and what they experienced by doing this, then yes, by all means, email Mavis. For sure. Oh, I need this was really an incredible experience to share with you. Thank you so much for inviting me to be a guest on your podcast. Thank you so much for having, for being here, for taking the time, for lifting it up to what we did, really. 
Thank you so much. And I guess we're at the end. <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay. I'll make sure people get the website uh, at the end of the podcast and get all the information they need to find the project. <laughs>